So um, I was told to, to be standing here um, because of the microphone. Um, I'm happy to talk to you today. Um, obviously, I was introduced, obviously, working in Neptune is my conflict of interest. Um, so for transparency reasons, I said that. And I have a second one because I'm married to Novartis. I mean, I'm not married to Novartis. My wife is working there, which makes our little son basically a double conflict of interest. Um, so that's going to be interesting in the future. Um, I won't be trying to duplicate things that you'll be uh, hearing already or that you will be hearing about, you know, how trials are set up or what, you know, um, the, the basics basically or the regulations. I was planning to, to show you some aspects um, that we are facing as, as an industry um, or that I've seen in my last 12, 13 years in, in industry. And also to give you maybe some hints, some advice, how to um, collaborate with us and what opportunities they are. So the first question basically, of course, um, in the year of 2017 is, do we need new drugs? Do we need new trials? Um, and I just took an example out of oncology. And the answer is clearly yes. So you see here an overview over the last 30, 40, 50 years. And there are several cancers like lung cancer, like stomach cancer, um, like renal cancer that is not up there, um, which have been, you know, the mortality decreased significantly by new drugs, by new standards of treatment, by better diagnosis, whatever. But then still, you have still cancers like uh, rectal cancer, pancreatic cancer, um, and others, liver, that are more or less, you know, didn't really change a lot. So, of course, um, there is place for new research, for new innovation. And is it only oncology? Um, of course, I'm talking to cardiologists probably. Um, no, and, and basically what I wanted to say is you're in a pretty good place for research because when you see here, and this is data from Austria, but it's, it's more or less the same for whole Europe, um, that approximately almost 50% of that is according to cardiovascular diseases. So there is still a lot of work to be done there. Um, there was a little talk about that in, in, in a, one of the previous presentations, and I wanted just to show you what we think as an industry, um, together with regulators, what is basically the purpose of, of performing clinical trials. So what are they good for? What, what can they do? So obviously it's, it's part of you know, tackling medical needs, so just um, going into the future. It's, it's basically randomized clinical trials are the foundation of evidence-based medicine, for now at least. Um, and for now, the most objective proof of efficacy and safety. Um, is it the best one? I don't know. For the time being, probably yes. We'll see what, what happens in the next years, and I will come to that a bit later. Um, of course, we are pushing innovation. Um, just to give you some, some sense what it, what it means, the, the biotech or pharma industry is the most in innovative industry in the world. So we are far, far in front of, of the car industry, of IT, even companies like Apple are, are coming in terms of, of R&D investments far behind us. Um, it gives patients, and that's really important, uh, early access to new substances. So basically not everyone has to wait until, you, until the drug comes to market, but you can be, you know, as a patient have opportunity to, um, to, to get a new drug, to get a new treatment years before it's approved, and I will show you something about that in, in my last slide, actually. And it's, of course, an economic factor. So for us, it's about patents, and I'm very open on that. It's about commercialization, so how can we earn the money back to reinvest it again um, in the research and development of new drugs? And I'll also come to that a bit, a back a bit later. Um, it's creating good jobs, high-profile jobs, on the industry side, but also on the academia side, on CROs, in the regulators. Um, and basically, you know, by providing or performing clinical trials, um, phase one to three, we are financing all costs in the trials. So in general, for that part of the life cycle, we are basically helping the systems to, to save some money. And you could ask, okay, that's, that's nice, but you know, what is it for me as an investigator? So what, what, what do I have from it? And there are a couple of things that always came across my path in the last 10 plus years. Um, 
let's say for the, for the other side, for the investigator, for the academia side, you know, you can be a part of this innovation if you want to. Um, you get yourself very early exposure to new drugs before they hit the market, and this is not to be underestimated, especially in areas like oncology or hematology. So you get experience with the treatments far before they get the approval. Also, of course, nowadays it's, it's about acquisition of funds for your hospitals, for your universities, and there are more ways to do that than just uh, clinical trials. I will show you that in the end. Um, you are gaining medical knowledge, know-how. Um, you are getting additional education. You know, just, just being a physician is not sufficient anymore uh, to perform a clinical trial. So we are talking about GCP courses, stuff like that. Um, of course, you can publish. A lot of um, the publications in the, in the top journals are coming out of the industry-sponsored trials. So um, by, by, you know, performing well in a trial just gives you opportunity to be one of the people on the, on the paper. Um, it creates networks. Um, it gives you national and international exposure, which is probably important if you are into um, doing any, any type of career as an academia. And um, it helps you become ideally an expert center, which means um, that you know, companies are looking into you as a site and not re-evaluating you any, every time a study is coming up, but we know what we can expect from you. And there are some must-haves, I would I like to put it that way, in a year of 2017 that, that we really need from you and that you have to provide if you're really into performing um, clinical trials. Um, the first thing and probably the most important is the quality. So, you know, you cannot do trials just on the fly like maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago. You have to, to, to respect all of the GCP, ICH and other regulations. Then a very important thing um, I really want to, to, to focus on is reliability. So basically, um, you know, you promise, when we do feasibilities at your sites, you make a kind of a promise what you can deliver. And, and you should be able and confident to deliver it. So don't make the mistake to underestimate yourselves. Of course, everyone has to market a bit what we do. But also don't, don't make the, the mistake to overestimate yourself. Because you know, telling in a feasibility that you can include whatever, 20 patients, and then you end up with two, is not a good way of, of creating a track record for the future. The next thing is, do you have sufficient patient numbers in your site? And if yes, are they available for the study? Um, an example, in Austria, we have a very, very high standard of care. So, of course, do we have patients with psoriasis, for example? Yes, we do. Do we have therapy-naive patients for psoriasis for placebo-controlled trials? Probably not. So you have to really be aware of your, you know, what your patient population is. Speed, um, the quicker the better, I would say, still keeping the quality. So don't sacrifice quality for speed. But speed relates both to startup time of the study in your centers and to recruitment. Um, we talked a bit about staff qualification expertise. So I'm not sure that even in our country, students are learning enough on how to, to you know, act and what they have to know as, an, as, as a potential investigator. Um, that was not the case when I was studying, for sure. I think it got better. Um, cost, important thing. So you know, calculate, and it doesn't matter if it's an industry-sponsored study or, or investigator-sponsored study that we support financially. I will come to that in the end. Um, you know, calculate reasonably, calculate realistically. Because it's a huge um, issue and, and, and not a good sign if, you know, as a, as a site come back after a study has already been performed for one, two, three years and ask for more money. This is something that we as companies don't really like. And we have problem discussing it without headquarters too, to be honest. And as I said, the track record. What else? And this is more on a, on a site and country perspective. So, your site needs to have the infrastructure to perform phase 
one to three trials nowadays. Even, it's even true for the, for the non-interventional studies. And I, I put explicitly here the word study nurse. So in my opinion, in my experience, there is no way you can do clinical trials success, successfully nowadays without having a proper study nurse in your site. That's just not possible. It's, it's gonna be overwhelming, overwhelming. And there are ways how to finance study nurses too. Um, then something I call, I'd like to call friendly administration in your hospitals, in your universities. So, you know, are you familiar with, with your legal guys, with your lawyers, you know? How, how long does a contract take? Do you know how, who to approach? Because it's a difference if you need to, for, a, for a contract review. I mean, we need time, of course. It's the same applies to us. But if you know, it's a difference if you need two months for a contract review or, or 10 in your chances of, gain, get, uh, of being choosed for, for as a site. Then the networks, you know, do you, do you know your referring partners, your retail-based physicians, for example? There are diseases that, that's not such, a, such an important point because of the just pure amount of the patients, but the more rare disease become, the more complicated and, and interesting and, and important this goes. Because if you only have an incidence of 10 patients per year in Austria for something, then you should know where these patients are. Good relations to authorities, to ethic committees, always help. Um, you have to, and this is the same like, like here or here quality, you have to have your own SOPs in place um, and regulations. We have ours, you can, you can believe me there. Too, too many of them probably, but it's another story. Um, you have to have a certain healthcare system infrastructure guaranteed. So, you know, what I mean is if, if a study includes, I don't know, PET scans, and there is only, and you're in a country where you have one PET scan for the whole country, uh, then that's gonna be a problem probably. So you have to be aware what, what our system can, can provide. And the last point is the country infrastructure. What I mean with that, probably the main point there is um, the traffic. It's as simple as that. So how long does a patient need to come to me as an investigator? If I need to see the patient in a clinical trial every week, and the patient has to travel four hours to my center and four hours back, then it's probably not the ideal world to be. And coming back to, 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 to the promise thing, these are data from quintiles. They are called uh, nowadays different um, and a couple of years old, but it's probably still, still really similar. And this is just showing you, you know, without any finger pointing, the, the reality versus the promise that, um, that was seen in Quintile's um, studies. Quintile's is probably the biggest CRO in the world, um, and then performing a whole lot of, whole bunch of studies. And what they have seen is basically that only the half of the sites are either, meet, either um, meeting target or exceeding target in, in terms of patient recruit, recruitment. And the other half is either underperforming or including zero patients. So every 10th site in a study is including no patients. And that's a problem. Um, that's a problem for us. It's a problem for you as a site. Um, and for, for example, in Amgen, um, at least for, for some types of, of studies, it depends a bit on, 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 again, on a disease, because if you have only two patients per year in a country, then it, it can end up that you don't have a patient. But, but for cardiovascular studies, I know that, I'm not sure if it's two or three months, if we see a site inactive for two or three months, so means without screening, without randomization, we are closing it. Because it's just, it's too expensive nowadays to keep such sites open. And this is something we have to be aware of. Again, in giving your promise. So sometimes it's even better not to take part in the study. This is what, what I have found out. Um, now, what is, what is important for you to know on, on how we kind of tick in our, in our minds? Um, this is my, or our, my and my colleagues' reality every day. Um, you know, our expectancy, and, and, and this is true for, for physicians and, and our partners on, as investigators, we always think, you know, a company decides to place a study and it's gonna be all over the place. In every single country that a company has an office, for engine it would be, I think, 90 or 100, um, the study is going to be running, but that's not true. So the studies are planned in our headquarters by a small group of people and then rolled out in multinationally. 
And basically what, what happens there is a kind of a stock market situation that when every single office um, in, in a company, like every single country starts screaming loud, I want to have the study. And there is the headquarter people sitting somewhere up there and just trying to decide, okay, where are we going to? What is the track record? What are the numbers? Um, and this has to do something with, with you know, different perspectives. So this is our perspective, of course. This is my perspective working here in Austria. Um, you know, in context of the world map, this is how I see Austria. <laughs> this is how Amgen sees Austria. You, know, you see the little red dot around here. And at exactly that is, you know, not fitting together all the time. So I, what I'm trying to tell you here is, um, don't expect that, you know, getting s studies, especially to smaller countries, it might not, might not be quite true for countries like Germany, France, the big five that are getting usually most of the study, but for the smaller ones, um, we have to fight very, very hard for every single study to, to get it to Austria. And we are, or to get it to, to our countries, and there we are really relying on you guys also to, to help us market our, um, our environment, our, our country, towards our headquarters. And if we don't get a study to Austria, you know, don't, don't, don't take it wrong. So it's nothing personal against you, it's just a reality, basically. So how is the decision made? Where to go? Um, Probably most people would say it's just about the money. So where, are the study, where is the study the cheapest? Probably India, everyone goes to India. That's not true. This is data from 2013, so it's maybe changed a bit. But you see here, the costs are about maybe nowadays 20, 25% influencing the decision where to put the study to. Um, and you have a, a, a big chunk of it, around 60% is site driven and investigator driven. So we are taking a very, very careful look from headquarter perspective, how a country and how a site is performing, or sites, and then trying to make a best decision, um, a balance between you know, getting to the optimal sites and keeping the budget. And of course, again, this is where you kind of come into play together with, with us, with the people working in, in the country offices. The next point, um, and, and the costs were, were a topic before, and I just wanted to illustrate um, why the prices are like they are, in the moment at least. Um, because pharma, what, what we do, uh, biotech pharma R&D, is, is really a costly and high risk game. And I'm not going through the, through the you know, phases of the study. What, what my messages here are, um, if you start here, but you know, just looking for the candidates, for drug candidates, which we call research. And then you go through your development, if it's early or, or late development, basically one out of five to 10,000 substances will make it to the market. Which shows you how risky the whole thing is. And which shows you how costly the whole thing is, because of course, um, and, the, and the other thing is, I, I, I forgot to say is, the patent starts here. So as soon as you think that you have found something interesting, you better go patent it because some, someone else is going to do it. And then we have a patent on drugs for 20 years, plus minus a couple of months, depending on, there are some exceptions. For example, if you're performing pediatric studies, you get an additional six months. But basically it's around 20 years and it starts here. So that at the time you come to the market, the half, at least the half of the time is already passed. And then in the rest of the time, you really have to show your investors by, you know, having, um, by reaching the results, by having a proper stock price, that the company is still worth investing into in the future. That the investors are still uh, basically willing to take this risk. And this really, if you, if you think into it, I don't know if the model is correct or not, um, but if you think into it, it is as, as it is. Um, it explains why drugs, developing of drugs can never be done by states or by public bodies, in my personal opinion, because they will never be willing to take these risks. They cannot do it. You know, I would not pay my, 
my, um, my, my taxes for someone to take such risks, to be honest. Um, and the other thing that I want to point out here is this tradition versus reality. You were a bit, there were a couple of comments before about you know going the proper way through phase preclinic pre and then phase one, two, three, and then you get the approval. That is still true, partly. Um, that is still true for some diseases, but this is going, there is going to be a, a lot of changes there in the next five to 10 years, I can promise you that. From our perspective as, a, as an industry, together with regulators, they are already thinking in, in different ways. And you will seeing, and again, it might be good, it might be bad. Um, you are seeing, you know, substancing coming out, out to and, and getting approved here or here. Um, and because, you know, nowadays um, you, you cannot, and, and I take, come back to oncology and hematology, which is okay to do because I think around 60% of all clinical trials are running, sponsored by the industry, are running in oncology and hematology. Um, you cannot do any phase one trials in oncology in, in healthy people. That's just not ethical. And so you do it with patients, and then of course what is happening nowadays all over the place is you are trying to do these trials as big as possible to, always, to already detect efficacy signals. And if you see those, if you see them very clearly, then of course the question also for the regulators is, okay, what, what do we do with that? And there have been a lot of cases in recent years of, of medicines, you know, getting approvals for second, third line treatments after phase 1B in phase 2, and then getting conditional approvals, which means you, have, you still have to do further studies, but you're on the market because you cannot keep the drug from the patient with pancreatic cancer, even if it's just five month survival for the next seven years while you are going through the process. So we'll see, we'll see significant changes there. And what adds to complexity, of course, is what, what are we you know, producing? What are we talking about? Several years ago, we were here, so it was all about small molecules, which is basically something that a learned chemi chemistrist uh, can do at home, more or less. Um, then came the, the antibodies. Um, now we are, then came the, the bispecific molecules, you know, fusion proteins. Uh, conjugates that connected antibodies with small molecules, with drugs, because you try to tackle diseases differently. Nowadays, we are going into stem cell therapy, gene therapy, um, living drugs. Um, so it's getting more and more personali personalized. And, and you have to think you know, of complexity of the approval process and also of performing a clinical trial with small molecule is something completely different than and doing it with this one here. And if you don't know what living drugs are, I can, again, come back to oncology. These are, for example, oncolytic viruses. So basically, you are um, injecting viruses into, into skin cancer lesions, and the virus is destroying the cells there and basically um, activating your immune system. But how, how do you handle these drugs? The other one are, are CAR T cells, for example. So T lymphocytes that you get out of the patient's body, change them genetically, um, to act against B cells, put them back into the patient, and then they do what they do. And this is, so this is a to to totally different process than what we've be, been used to doing here with you know, preclinic phase one to three, and then we get the approval. And everyone can do that, every site probably. And then I think you, you have heard something about it today of already, is, um, and it fits good to the, to the previous presentation. You know, of course, getting the approval is not the end of the story then the story gets interesting. And we were all used to, you know, we're looking at phase four trials, maybe observational studies, um, maybe some registries, maybe some healthcare records, whatever. Now we are entering a totally new era. And it's, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens in the next five to 10 years. So what role are, you know, for the real world data and, and out of that real world evidence, are things going to play like, um, Data from insurances, um, social media, you know? What, what we do get out of analyzing uh, Facebook? Because patients are on Facebook. They are writing on Facebook how they are doing. Um, what about wearables, you know, Apple Watch? All the gimmicks that, that everyone uses, these are, there are data collected and the question is how can we integrate it into what we call real world data and, and what information additionally it can provide us? So that's going to be a funny thing to do, to see what happens. 
And in the end, I would just like to give you some um, or to show you some opportunities that you as investigators have in, in kind of, you know, collaborating with, with us. So what can you do? And there are several aspects here. So in the middle, you, you, you know, there is the classic industry sponsored clinical trial where we develop a protocol together with a steering committee and then we decide to go to certain countries, to certain sites, and then we approach you and you basically perform the trial, recruit patients, and that's it. Um, there is one very interesting thing which is called investigator-sponsored trials or investigator-sponsored studies or whatever every company is calling it a bit differently, uh, where basically you as an investigator are entering into the role of a sponsor, of a GCP sponsor of the trial. So you're approaching us with an idea that fits, of course, generally to what we are doing. And then we discuss what you want to do, we review it. And in the best case, we fund it. But it's your study, right? And that's really important thing to, to know because being a sponsor of a study, come back to also what you were telling, um, is something totally different than just running a clinical trial sponsored by someone else. So the, at least in Austria, there are not a lot of you know, hospitals and universities that can do that really properly because you have totally different obligations towards regulators, towards ethic committees, whatever. How, how, how do you, then we have here, also majority of the companies are providing things that they call research grants, awards, whatever, where basically you can also submit maybe even something that you're already working on and, and try to you know, get the award, get the grant. Um, quite simple process, of course, not the amount that you would maybe get if you go for any investigative sponsor trial, but still you can get some funds out of here. Um, and then we have two other things, what, like preclinical academic collaborations and business development. I will come to that a bit later. This is basically your way of approaching a, a company in getting the substances in the pipeline to test them yourselves, to just see you know, what you can do with them. And this one is about, um, imagine as a university, you are developing a drug candidate or a biomarker or a diagnose tool or whatever, and you come to a certain point, you, you made a spin-off out of the university, and then you have to find a partner, industry partner, to further develop it. And I will show you how, what I mean with that. So how, how do you do that? This one is pretty simple. You just sit together with your partners on the industry side, so in my case with, with my team in Amgen, and just talk, you know. Every company has what we call potential areas of interest, which means these are areas that we as a company are interested in sponsoring academic studies in, which has, as I said, has to do on a general level with what we are into already now. So coming to me and, and discussing a psychiatric uh, trials on depression will probably not be, um, uh, will probably have a negative input or on, on, in terms of decision, but you know, going into cardiovascular thing, um, we have a product there, we have further products in the pipeline there, so um, maybe something comes out. And this covers also basic research, so don't be, you know, misunderstood that this is just for, for clinical research. So, you know, find out who is your partner, partner, MSL, medical advisor, whatever, myself, and then we just have a conversation. What about this? This is as simple as Google. You know, take, take an hour or two, go to company websites, and there, is, there are researches and grants all over the place. You just have to find them, right? And then you can submit and see what happens. What about this one? I can show you what, at Amgen what we are doing with preclinical co collaborations. It's pretty simple, actually. So you just go to amgen.com, you go to partners, and then um, academic collaboration, and then you can basically enter a request where you just simply enter your own data. Of course, what do you want to research? Why? With what substance? With what, you know, with mice, with rats, whatever. And, and send it off via website. And then we in the, in the headquarters have a group of people reviewing these, these proposals and coming back to you. It's a very, actually very simple process, not the rocket science. And the same applies for, for business development. Again, it's at least at Amgen or on our website, there is, you cannot see it properly, it's submit a project. So if you have a, let's say, interesting biomarker in multiple myeloma uh, in development, and you think that you know, maybe Amgen could be potentially interested to collaborate, and we have had a lot of cases like that in the last five to 10 years, 
Um, you submit it, that's the first step. You know, I can do it for you, but you can do it yourself. Um, and by that, um, I come to my conclusion. So all, all that I showed and that you are doing, so what it's all about, you know, why are we doing this? And, and in my opinion, and this is really my, my personal belief every single day, is to see things like that happen. And, and you know, even in, in times of trouble and challenges and issues in our every, everyday work on our side and your side, this is what it's all about. So you see here Emily, you can go her, on her web page. Um, Emily was a kid, um, she was five years old and diagnosed in 2010 with ALL, with acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, with basically, as, as a kid, you have a chance of cure of around 90% when you get the diagnosis. She got chemo, she was in remission, and then she had, a year later she had a relapse because she was unfortunately one of the 10%. Um, you get chemo again, and at that point of time, you have a cure rate of around 30%. So she got chemo, she had a planned uh, transplant, bone marrow transplant, and a week before the transplant, she relapsed again, where basically was a point of time where the doctor said to her parents, um, so we can give some chemotherapy, it won't, you know, it won't benefit at all. So that's basically, that was her death sentence. She was six or seven years old at the time. And then, they found out that in a center, it, it's a US um, girl uh, in Philadelphia, um, a company, it was not Amgen, it was another company, although also we are working on CAR T cells, um, was starting a phase one CAR T cell trial. And they approached the physician, um, and Emily was really um, included in the, in the study, in the phase one study, as a third, first uh, youth patient worldwide that received CAR T cells. Um, I don't know how, how deep you are into this, but it's a, it's a very, you know, it's a very effective therapy, but, but I would say a dangerous therapy, because basically what it does is um, it, it kills all of your B cells, and, and it um, activates your, your immune system in a way that basically um, what you usually see is, is a cytokine release syndrome, where people end up in, in intensive care. And this is what happened to Emily, so she almost died, during the therapy, she was several weeks on, on, in ICU, but she survived and is for now, for five, more than five years, cancer-free. And so for, for myself, that's basically my personal motivation, why I'm working here and why I'm standing in front of you now. Thank you.